Good afternoon. The first item of business today is First Minister's questions. And as members will know, having introduced a new format, uh, I would like to take as many contributions as possible. And in that spirit, I would ask all members, where possible, to keep their questions short and their answers as succinct as possible. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of today. I will have First engagements Minister. to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ms. Thank Davidson. you. Presiding Officer, we learnt this week the following, that a third of S2 pupils aren't meeting basic standards in numeracy, that in the last four years, the percentage of P4 pupils performing well in numeracy has fallen by 10%. And that the attainment gap between children from richer and poorer backgrounds has, under the SNP, got wider. We've already had one ministerial apology in the Chamber for the Government's performance this week. Aren't parents and pupils due one too? Well, I have made clear, as has the Education Secretary uh, this week, the findings of the SSLN survey are not acceptable to me. Uh, the duty of this government, my duty as First Minister, working of course with local authorities and with others, is to ensure that we have an education system in which standards are rising and the inequality gap is closing. That's what we are determined uh, to bring about, which is why we have embarked on a major programme of reform and improvement in our education system. A key part of that, of course, is making sure that in future we have much better data than the data provided for us in SSLN. That is limited in its coverage. It's based on a sample that includes just four pupils per primary school, 12 pupils per secondary school. And crucially, uh, while it gives us a snapshot of performance at national level, it doesn't enable us to tell school by school how schools are performing. That's why the National Improvement Framework will lead to more comprehensive school by school data that allows us to target our efforts more closely. And of course, this survey predates any impact from the work that we have already started, work on the attainment challenge, focusing on literacy and numeracy, and of course, additional resources through the attainment fund targeted on schools in our most deprived areas. And in the delivery plan that John Swinney will outline before the summer recess, we will set out plans for further reforms, a new funding formula, more resources going directly to schools and greater empowerment of head teachers and parents. I've made clear on numerous occasions, and I do so again today, how important this is to me and to this government, and we're determined to drive the improvements that all of us want to see. Well, the view might be different from over here, but the answers are still the same and they're just as long. Um, but let's turn to the First Minister's plan to make this right, because she mentioned their data. And last year she said that she was frustrated that the government didn't know enough about standards for younger pupils, that she wanted more information about performance made available. The Deputy First Minister now, of course, the Education Secretary also admitted there was, and I quote, a weakness because information wasn't collected nationally. And in other words, no one was able to see what was going on. And their answer was standardised assessment. So can I ask, are those assessments going to give all of the information that she said the country needs? First Minister. If Ruth Davidson had read the National Improvement Framework, if she'd listened, as I'm sure she has to be fair to her, closely to this debate over the previous weeks and, and months, she would know the answers to these questions. Uh, Standardised assessments will be introduced and work is ongoing to ensure that they uh, are introduced later this year. Standardised assessments will, for the first time, inform the judgments that teachers make about the numbers of pupils that are meeting the required levels of curriculum for excellence. And then for the first time, we are going to publish not just local authority by local authority, but school by school, the percentages of pupils that are and crucially who are not meeting the required levels of curriculum for excellence. Uh, that will give us data uh, that allows us to target our efforts on a much uh, closer basis. It will also enable us for the first time to measure comprehensively what the attainment gap is, because this information will also be broken down on a socio-economic basis, and it will allow, allow us to set measurable and tangible targets for closing that attainment gap. And as I have said, I want to see us make significant progress in closing that attainment gap within the lifetime of this parliament, and I want to see us substantially eliminate that gap over the next 10 years. I'm very clear on what we are seeking to do. I'm very clear about the plans we have to put in place and implement 
to do that. And I hope all sides of this chamber will get behind us, uh, because other parties uh, are very fond, and rightly so, to be fair, of talking about the importance of this. Let's see if they have the courage of their convictions when it comes to backing us in the action we need to take. I'm interested in the First Minister's reply, but I have to say that others have been an awful lot clearer than she has been on this, because the EIS has just published an advice note, which I have here, and it claims that her plans, the plans of her government, have been watered down. It says that the government's original idea was to assess young people and have the results of all of these assessments published. But the EIS now says it's forced changes. It says that standardised test scores will not be collected nor published. And it adds that there is actually no need for all pupils to sit assessments in the first place. So the First Minister said that publishing more information and more data was vital if we were to improve our schools. But it now appears she's backing off from her own original plans. Why hasn't she stuck by them? Can I say, uh, firstly and very clearly, uh, I have. And I think if Ruth Davidson had been listening to the comments I made when I published the National Improvement Framework earlier this year, and indeed looked at the detail of the National Improvement Framework, she would find the answers to these questions. Uh, the data that we are going to publish, comprehensive data that has never been published before about the percentage of children meeting the required levels of curriculum for excellence, not a snapshot survey, not a national survey, uh, but information that will be provided school by school, local authority by local authority, informed by the assessments that will be carried out. That was made clear uh, in the National Improvement Framework and it will continue to be so. And on the point about uh, whether or not all pupils will be required to set assessments. Let me make it absolutely clear. Yes, they will be. That is my expectation and that is what I intend to see happen. Uh, clearly, there will be some pupils uh, for very particular reasons, special needs, for example, where there may be a different approach. But the general uh, thrust of this is that these assessments uh, will be carried out in our schools. It will inform the judgments that teachers make. That will lead to the publication of information that will give us, for the first time, a clear picture of what is happening in each of our schools. And then we will be able to take action if any particular school or if any particular area is not performing in the way that we think necessary. That is a clear plan of action and it's a clear plan of action uh, designed to deliver the very clear objectives that I am setting. Thank officer, the fact's this. This time last year, the First Minister said that she was determined to publish more information for parents and for government to see school by school. She could not have been clearer. And in fact, in January, when she was asked by the Financial Times, by the Financial Times, do you think you will make all all the NIF data publicly available? And she answered, yes. But now we have the teachers union, the teachers themselves saying, that's not what's happening. We have an education secretary who's asked for more time. And this government has had nine years, nine, nine. years of SNP education failures. We need much more information on the state of our schools, full publication, not just a sample, Full publication was the right answer six months ago. It's still the right answer today. But they are backing off from it. That's what they've told the teachers across our country. The First Minister and I agree that this needs to be done. We will absolutely stick by our guns. Why isn't she sticking by hers? First Minister. The, the leader of the main opposition party may have changed, but there doesn't appear to be any greater ability on that leader's part to adapt her questions to the answers that she's actually given. So let me try and make it clearer. All of the, the data that the National Improvement Framework says will be gathered and published will be gathered and published. That has not changed. Sure. That remains the case now uh, in the way that it was when I published the National Improvement Framework. No change whatsoever uh, to that. Uh, and secondly, Ruth Davidson has just said there it shouldn't be a sample. Was she not listening to a single word I said? The problem with the SSLN data that we're all talking about this week is that that is sample information. If you go to, I think, section six of the SSLN publication and see the methodology, what you find is that that is a sample drawn from information based on four pupils in every participating primary school and 12 pupils in every secondary school. That is a sample survey. What we are talking now about publishing is information uh, on the percentages of pupils, all pupils, not samples of pupils, 
all pupils and whether or not they meet the required levels of curriculum for excellence on a local authority by a local authority basis and on a school by school basis. Detailed comprehensive information that allows us to tell not just a snapshot of how our education system is performing but how each and every school across the country is performing. That means if we have to take action in particular areas or particular schools that should be done. That's information that no previous government has published. This will be published for the first time and it is a sign of the determination that we have to deal with the problem we're, we're talking about. And if Ruth Davidson is serious about what she's saying, about wanting to to get behind the government, then she should stop trying to find manufactured differences and actually get behind us. Put our money where our mouth is. Thank you. I call Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet the General Secretary of the STUC. First uh, I meet with the General Secretary of the STUC on a regular uh, basis, uh, biannually. Uh, at our last meeting, which took place on the 9th of March, we discussed uh, matters including the economy, the trade union bill and the EU referendum. And the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work will meet with the General Secretary of the TUC later today. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. We've just heard the First Minister and the Tories dance around how they would collaborate to test our pupils harder. But surely the priority has to be to ensure that our children can learn better in our schools. And there's one thing missing from that exchange. Neither the SNP or the Tories have faced up to the fact that government cuts are devastating our schools. This week, this week, the government's own figures showed a scandalous decline in numeracy levels. Every stage getting worse. The gap between the richest and the rest growing. Just one in four children from the most deprived backgrounds with the math skills they need to get on in life. A disgrace, First Minister. So does the First Minister, does the First Minister agree with the conclusion of one newspaper this week when it simply said, you have failed our kids. Well, First Minister. Interestingly, interestingly, when the National Improvement Framework was published earlier this year, um, I seem to recall, I'm sure she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I seem to recall Kezia Dugdale and Ian Gray backing the approach we were taking to assessment. Now today, of course, she appears to be jumping on the bandwagon, the Liberal Democrat bandwagon of saying it's all about testing our children. She should really make her mind up what side of this debate she's on. And in terms of resources, we've been very clear about the need to increase resources to tackle attainment. That's why the plans we set out in the election plans that were approved by the Scottish electorate, which is why I'm standing here answering questions again today, are to increase funding uh, by an extra £750 million over this parliament, specifically targeted at attainment. By the end of this parliament, we'll be spending an extra half billion pounds a year on early years education and childcare, because all of the evidence says that giving young people the best start to their educational life is key to solving this challenge. We're also getting more of that resource direct to head teachers and we said that not just are we going to increase the resource we're going to have a new funding formula so that that resource gets to the places where it's needed most places where more children uh, are come from backgrounds of deprivation so not only do we have the plans through the national improvement framework the reform plans that will be set out in the delivery plan this is backed by substantial additional resources and I'd say the same to Kezia Dugdale as I've just said to Ruth Davidson if you're serious about wanting to see us raise standards in education and close the equality gap, then get behind us. Let's make a national effort on behalf of our children rather than another petty party political point scoring exercise. First Minister, if you're serious about tackling the attainment gap, you don't wait nine years to get started. Yeah. And here goes. She tells us it's our number one priority, but here's our 2007 manifesto, page 48. We will pay particular attention to raising the achievement of the poorest 20% of school pupils with increased early intervention and support. How dare the First Minister come to Parliament after nine years and say she's finally getting round to it? It's a disgrace. 
these stats, presiding officer, are the reality of this government cutting the education budget by 10%. Young people left without the basic skills they need to prosper. Young working class people denied a place in our universities. Real people paying a real price for the real cuts that this SNP government have made. You have been in power for nearly a decade now. Surely the First Minister regrets cutting 10% from the education and skills budget. First Minister. Let me talk about some of the progress that has been made during our time in office. I don't think it's enough, which is why we are making this such a big priority. But let me look at uh, what the situation was in terms of uh, the gap between our 20% most and least deprived pupils achieving a qualification at level five. Uh, when we took office, that gap was 36 percentage points. Today, it's still too big, but it's down to 22 percentage points. The number of pupils from the 20% least deprived areas leaving school without any qualifications has more than halved since we took office in 2007. So that's the progress that we have made. I don't think that progress is far enough or fast enough, which is why we have made this such a priority, backed by the substantial extra resources that I've spoken about. And I do think, presiding officer, that I've made uh, no doubt, I've, I've left no doubt about the scale of the challenge I think rests on my shoulders and on the shoulders of this government. But I think there's a challenge here for the parliament as a whole as well. If we are all serious about raising attainment and closing that equality gap, then it's time to get behind the efforts of the government so that we can together make the progress we need to see. The question today is the opposition capable of rising to that challenge. Yes. Yes, yeah, 10% cuts, presiding officer, let's put that into real money. That's £850 million that you have cut from education and training budgets since 2007. Now you stand there and tell us that you've put £750 million more in over the next five years, yet you've taken £850 million out. Now I know numeracy isn't a strength for the First Minister this week, but surely she can work that one out. Now the First Minister is faced with a choice. She can work with parties on the left to invest in education and skills, or she can side with the Tories and impose even deeper cuts on our schools. Now, the First Minister and I are agreed the gap between the richest and the rest in our schools is shameful. But there is an even bigger gap, presiding officer, and that's the one between the First Minister's ambition and the reality of her budgets. So when will the First Minister do the math and accept she can't cut the attainment gap whilst she is cutting school budgets? First Minister. Well, Again, just in point of fact, uh, between this uh, government taking office and 2014-15, the most recent figure I have here, the money available uh, in terms of education and training rose by 7.8%. But that's just uh, one particular fact to chair, uh, chair with the Chamber. Uh, Kezia, Dugdale asks me, Kezia Dugdale asks me to pick sides in this chamber or on this question of education and raising attainment for children across Scotland, particularly for those from most disadvantaged backgrounds. Let me be very clear about this, presiding officer. Uh, I am on the side of Scotland's children and Scotland's yeah. young people, nobody else's. I will do... I will do whatever it takes to make sure we've got an education system with rising standards and with an equality gap that is closing, not growing. As I've already cited today, there are signs of progress in key areas, but there are other areas where we need to do more and we need to do it faster. So I'm clear about the challenge I face. Uh, I believe I am up to that challenge. The question for the opposition is, are they? Uh, thank you. I'm going to take uh, the first of a number of constituency questions from Jenny Gilruth. Uh, before I do, I'd just like to make the Chamber aware this first question relates to the tragic case of Liam Fee. And members might be aware this case is still active, sentence has not yet been passed, and so there are a number of restrictions in place, both on the questioner and on the response. Jenny, Gil Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I know that the First Minister and every member in the Chamber will join me in condemning the murder of Liam Fee in my constituency. I recognise that the Fife Child Protection Committee have instructed a significant case review, but will the First Minister assure me that once this review is concluded, all relevant facts pertaining to Liam's short life and his untimely death 
will be placed in the public domain and that any failings of the relevant organisations involved will be dealt with robustly. First Minister. Well, President Officer, can I firstly, and I'm sure I do this on behalf of all of us in this chamber, can I express my horror and my sadness at the tragic death of uh, Liam Fee. Uh, my deepest sympathies uh, go to everyone affected by this horrific crime, uh, including, of course, the two other young boys who also suffered appalling abuse and neglect. Uh, I very much welcome the announcement by the Fife Child Protection Committee that a significant case review will now be carried out. Uh, we fully support the publication of all appropriate findings from significant case reviews. Uh, the decision on whether to publish the report will ultimately be for the relevant Child Protection Committee. And of course, there will always be, in cases like this, sensitive information that cannot be shared. However, taking that into account, we would hope and expect that the committee uh, would decide to publish as much of the information as they possibly can. It is absolutely essential uh, that any lessons that do need to be learned from this appalling tragedy are learned uh, and acted upon very swiftly. Um, in order to ensure that learning gets into the system uh, more quickly and consistently, we are also, of course, reviewing key aspects right now of the child protection system, including significant case reviews as part of our child protection improvement uh, programme. Uh, finally, presiding officer, uh, I think it is important, uh, and this is a, a fundamental point to make, that the only people responsible uh, for the death of Liam Fee are the people who were convicted of his murder. They are to blame and no one else. Uh, but there are questions rightly being asked about whether there is any more that the system could or should have done to protect this little boy. Uh, those questions must be examined in detail uh, and answers must be given. And that is what will now happen in the weeks and months that lie ahead. Thank you. I call on Colin Beattie. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government will provide to the 88 workers likely to be affected by the first bus proposal to cease operations in East Lothian and close its depots in Musselburgh and North Berwick. First Minister. Well, I am concerned at the prospect of job losses at first bus, uh, and I know that this will be a difficult time for all those who are affected and for their families. The Minister for Transport has met First Scotland uh, East Management to discuss their plans. Uh, the company has started a collective consultation process with trade unions uh, to discuss potential redundancies and options for redeployment within the company. And in parallel, East Lothian Council is in contact with other operators to consider how to mitigate the impacts on passengers of first withdrawal of bus services. Uh, of course, through our PACE initiative, we have already offered support for any employees who may be affected, uh, and the company has accepted this offer of support. So we will continue to engage with the company to try to mitigate the impact of their plans, but also do everything we can to help the employees who might be affected by these plans. Thank you. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will know that the UHI, the University of the Highlands Islands, is planning new student accommodation. Uh, is she aware that the proposed development in Lerwick would mean the removal of an engineering business that currently employs 16 men and women on that particular site? And would you be prepared to speak to the UHI or be in contact with the UHI and make sure that the timescale for that development means that the engineering business has enough time to move to new premises that they are currently planning? First Minister. I am aware of this and I, I believe if it is the, the business that uh, Tavish Scott is referring to, it's HMP uh, Limited, an engineering business uh, in, in Lerwick. Uh, I do understand the concerns that the member has expressed today and I understand that a number of local partners have already been involved in dialogue about the sale and future use of the land on this site. I will be very happy to make sure that officials make contact with all relevant colleagues in Shetland, including the University of the Highlands and Islands, to establish the current context and provide any advice and assistance uh, that we can to help secure a satisfactory outcome for all parties involved, including the company that Tavish Scott has mentioned. And I'd be happy to uh, ask the, the Minister concerned to meet with Tavish Scott to discuss what more can be done as well. And a final supplementary in this section, Mary Evans. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the Airbus Super Puma that crashed off Norway in April, killing 13 people, including Ian Stewart, an oil worker from Lawrence Kirk in my constituency. There is news today that Norway has added search and rescue flights to its ban on the Airbus Super Puma H225 helicopters due to signs of metal fatigue in the crashed helicopter's gearbox. What assurances can the First Minister provide to ensure that the Super Puma fleet in Scotland is held to the highest safety standards? Minister. 
Uh, well, firstly, um, President Officer, can I take this opportunity to convey uh, my sympathies and condolences, and I'm sure the sympathies and condolences of the whole chamber, uh, to the family of Ian Stewart, who uh, sadly died in this tragic accident. Uh, the safety of workers both in the North Sea and on search and rescue remains absolutely paramount, and I give an assurance that the Scottish Government will continue to liaise very closely with the oil and gas uh, industry and with relevant regulators. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, industry bodies Body Oil and Gas UK has formed a helicopter resilience working group uh, which seeks to bring platform operators together to share information and to develop further opportunities to safeguard uh, the safety of workers and collaborate on maintaining and improving production. Uh, so we will continue to liaise with all interested parties to make sure safety is absolutely at the top of everybody's agenda and I'd be very happy uh, to ask the Minister uh, responsible for these issues uh, to liaise with Mary Evans to make sure that uh, any matter of interest to her constituents are shared with her. Thank you. I call on Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday morning. Mr Harvey. Thank you. <coughs> Many of us had expected before the end of the last parliamentary session to hear a formal response from the Government to its, in, its own independent poverty advisor, uh, her report and recommendations. We didn't get that before the end of the last session, but now the First Minister has given us a commitment in her statement last week to implement all of those recommendations. I very much welcome that commitment. Recommendation 9 was for the Government to be bold on local tax reform, and the report recognised that council tax is widely viewed as no longer fit for purpose. Does the First Minister now agree, as she always used to, that the council tax is indeed no longer fit for purpose. First Minister. Well, I can confirm again today, as we did in our manifesto and as I did in the Chamber uh, last week when I outlined our priorities for government, that we do accept and will take forward all of the recommendations of the Independent Poverty Advisor. The formal response uh, to her report will be published uh, shortly and indeed I will also uh, very soon uh, reappoint an Independent Poverty Advisor because I think the work uh, that has been done there has been valuable and I want to make sure that we continue to have that input in future. Um, it would surprise Patrick Harvey to hear me say uh, that the plans we put forward in the election, plans which uh, seem to meet with the approval of a significant proportion of the Scottish electorate uh, to reform local taxation both in the short term uh, and more funded fundamentally in the longer term are bold plans. They are about making local taxation fairer and more progressive and they ask those living in the most expensive households to pay more. They also, crucially, going back to some of the uh, issues we've been discussing earlier in this session, they will raise an additional £100 million every year for education, money that I intend will go direct to head teachers in our schools. So I believe these are bold and far-reaching plans, but of course on this, as on a range of other issues, as we go through this session, and particularly as the Finance uh, Minister uh, starts to put together our budget for next year, we will liaise and consult and talk to parties across the Chamber, and we'll be happy to listen to any ideas for how we can further approve, improve our plans. Mr Harvey. Tweaking the upper bands on the council tax does not sound to anybody, surely, like bold reform of local taxation. This is not a time for tinkering with a broken system. As the advisor's report stated, this is a central moment of political decision, an opportunity to introduce a much more progressive system. What the First Minister has already announced clearly falls well short of that. She has the Commission on Local Taxation Reforms report on one hand and the report from the Poverty Advisor on the other. And following a stated commitment to this chamber last week to implement that recommendation for bold local tax reform, this clearly is a moment for much bolder action. If this isn't enough, what on earth will it take to persuade the government that it's time to kill off the council tax for good and adopt a modern, fair and flexible system of funding our local services. First Minister. Well, can I say firstly, we put forward our plans, uh, plans that I believe were bold in the election. Patrick Harvey put forward his plans in the election and, and the electorate cast uh, their votes. I, I'm standing here as First Minister uh, with a mandate to take forward the proposals that we were elected on. And I think, I think it's fair to say that. Uh, but as I have always said and will continue to say we will seek to reach out across the chamber to try to build consensus on some of these big issues that confront us. So I'm happy to confirm to Patrick Harvey that as we uh, head towards our budget we will talk 
to, to him and his colleagues, as well as to others in this chamber, uh, to hear the ideas uh, that other parties have to strengthen uh, proposals. So that's an open invitation uh, to Patrick Harvey and to others. I intend to be as collaborative as I possibly can be in seeking to take forward the proposals and the policies of this government and to do the right thing for the country. But I'm also uh, mindful of the fact that I stood in a manifesto uh, and a significant proportion of the Scottish electorate voted for me to be First Minister on the strength of that manifesto and I've got a duty to be true to that as well. Thank you. Willie Rennie. Uh, what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet? First Minister. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Mr Rennie. Um, can the First Minister give a guarantee that there will be no Scottish Government contracts with the China Rail Group CR3? First Minister. Well, any proposals that came forward for specific contracts uh, involving specific projects would be subject to the full and normal due diligence and the opportunity for this Parliament to scrutinise and to reach a view uh, on uh, the, the pros and cons, merits or otherwise, of any particular proposals. The fact of the matter is there are no particular proposals at that stage uh, right now, uh, and therefore, uh, in, in a sense, Willie Rennie is asking me an entirely hypothetical uh, question, but I will continue to make sure uh, that Parliament Parliament has the full opportunity to scrutinise any proposals that do come forward. Will there any? Uh, this was no email chain between office juniors. It's an official government document. It's got the signature of the First Minister of our country. It's with one of the most powerful nations in the world. It's worth £10 billion. Why would the First Minister bother signing this agreement if it didn't mean anything? We are right to ask why she put her name to this document when Amnesty International condemned the company's human rights abuses in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Why she signed with a company that is blacklisted by the Norwegian oil fund because of the risk of gross corruption. Mm -hmm. I can't understand why she continues to defend this. Why does she continue to defend this? First Minister. Well, you know, hold the front page. First Minister of Scotland seeks to explore opportunities for investment and jobs into Scotland. Shock, horror. You know, that is part of the job of the First Minister of this country. And the fact that Willie Rennie doesn't recognise that as a core responsibility of the First Minister is probably part of the reason why he will never stand here as First Minister of this country. The memorandum. The memorandum of understanding that was signed was, as anybody can see, because it's there to be read on the Scottish Government's website, uh, was an agreement to explore where there might be opportunities. Uh, there is not a single penny of investment that has been agreed or released or invested yet. If there are proposals brought forward for specific investments, then they will go through, uh, through full due diligence. And all of the issues that Willie Rennie has just cited in this chamber will be fully examined and taken into account. That's the right and proper proper way to proceed. I will always, uh, as First Minister, seek to act in the best interests of this country, and part of acting in the best interests of this country is to encourage investment that then supports job creation in Scotland, and I'll continue to do that job to the best of my ability. Neil Findlay. Uh, will the First Minister join me in calling on the uh, Economy Committee or the Europe and External Affairs Committee to look not just at the China deal, but also the Qatar deal as well, because there are elements of this that really need uh, to be put under real scrutiny. First Minister. Uh, I'd be delighted for any committee of this parliament that so wished to look into any of these matters. It's not for me to tell committees what they should look into, but I'd be very happy if they chose to do so and the Scottish Government would fully cooperate with it. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact the introduction of a ban on air weapons has had. First Minister. Well, the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Act, which gained royal assent on the 4th of August last year, sets out a new licensing regime which will allow the police to issue certificates only to those who have a legitimate need or use for an air weapon. 
Uh, this will help to reduce gun crime and improve public safety. Advance applications for licences can be made to the police from the 1st of July this year and from the 31st of December it will be an offence to use, possess, purchase or acquire an air weapon without the necessary certificate or permit unless a person is exempt under the legislation. Ahead of this, of course, the police are running a three-week hand-in campaign uh, which runs until the 12th of June. Uh, there's been a good response so far with more than 2,300 air weapons surrendered in the first week alone. Julian Martin. In many communities such as rural Aberdeenshire, which I represent, the use of air weapons are a part of life, particularly in land management. Can the First Minister assure me that this legislation won't change that and will simply help to ensure that such weapons are only ever used in a safe and responsible way? First Minister. Well, we've always acknowledged the important role that shooting plays in rural and agricultural life. In fact, the legislation itself makes specific provision to allow young people to continue to shoot to help protect crops and livestock or to control pests. As in all other cases, if a person can satisfy the Chief Constable that they are a proper person to have an air weapon, that they have a legitimate reason for having it, and that then they can shoot in a safe environment, then they should be able to both apply for and obtain a certificate. So I think that takes account of the legitimate concerns that Gillian Martin has raised. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Although over 2,000 air weapons have been handed in to the police already, it's estimated that there are 500,000 air guns in Scotland, and Police Scotland are already facing a backlog of firearms and shotgun licences. What additional funding will the Scottish Government put in place to help Police Scotland deal with the new air weapons regime? First Minister. Well, I, as I understand it, the police are satisfied that they have the resources in place to deal uh, with the implications of the legislation. I'll ask the Justice Secretary to write to Oliver Mundell with the detail uh, of the resource requirements and the resources that are available. But I hope all of us across the chamber would recognise uh, the objective of this legislation and the objective of the Hand In campaign, which is to get guns uh, off our streets and make Scotland safer. The police have got a crucial part to play in that and the government have got a crucial part to play in supporting the police to do that job. Douglas Ross. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the former Cabinet Secretary for Justice prior to and since the publication of his recent book. First Minister. Well, the content of the recently published book is, of course, a matter for the former Justice Secretary and his publishers. In line with the requirements of the Ministerial Code and uh, what are called the Radcliffe Principles, a draft of the manuscript was provided to the Permanent Secretary in February uh, this year by Kenny McCaskill. In response, and again, in line with the requirements of the Code and the Radcliffe Principles, it was made clear to Kenny McCaskill that ultimate responsibility for the content of the book was a matter for him. Uh, no discussions have taken place since publication. Mr Ross. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that response. In his book, the former Cabinet Secretary reopened old wounds. He contested the judgment of three law lords and cast significant doubts over the Scottish judicial system, which he was responsible for. Will the First Minister ask the new Lord Advocate to investigate the former Justice Secretary and the claims made? And given, and given the First Minister sat round the same Cabinet table as Kenny McCaskill, both were part of a government which repeatedly stated it did not doubt the safety of the conviction, will she make herself and all other ministers who served with Mr McCaskill available to an inquiry? Yes. <laughs> Well, in, in fairness to the member, I know he hasn't been in Parliament for very long, but, you know, the First Minister does not direct the Lord Advocate when it comes to investigation. That, that is a, a, pretty, a pretty fundamental element of our constitution. Um, in terms of some of the other aspects of, of the question, I think uh, much of it was ludicrous in nature. Uh, I haven't actually had the opportunity yet to read the book, so I'm going on uh, what has uh, been printed in newspapers. I'm sure it's a, an interesting read, but of course the content of it is a matter for Kenny uh, and for his publishers. In terms of the uh, Lockerbie conviction, the conviction stands. I, I say again, as the Crown Office have said in the past, that there is uh, confidence in the safety of that conviction. And of course, for that conviction to be overturned, there would require to be an appeal uh, taken and an appeal being successful. So that is the situation now. It's the situation before the book was published and it remains the situation today. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First, I must declare an interest as a signatory to the Justice for Megrahi campaign. First Minister, given that there is an issue that the former Justice Secretary and the former First Minister now both state 
that McGrahy was not the purchaser of the clothes in Malta, and having regard to the findings of the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, that if McGrahy was not the purchaser, there was insufficient evidence to convict him, can I ask the government to reconsider its position, and I quote that they say there is no reason to doubt the safety of this conviction, because surely it, there is definitely now. First Minister. Well, it, it is not for me, for any First Minister, or for any uh, member of the government uh, to uh, decide that a conviction is unsafe. That is a matter for the courts of the land. That is the case in this uh, case, and it is the case in any other uh, criminal matter. And of course, the situation is clear. It remains open uh, for close relatives of Mr Al Megrahi to ask the uh, Criminal Cases Review Commission to refer the case to the Appeal Court again. Ministers have repeatedly made clear that they would be comfortable if that was to happen, but that is the process that must be undertaken if this case is to be looked at by the Appeal Court. Uh, convictions are determined in courts and convictions can only be upheld or overturned in courts. That's the way we do these things in this country and it's the right way to do them. Claire Baker. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that victims of rape are supported during a police investigation. First Minister. Well, the government is committed to ensuring that the justice system responds sensitively and appropriately to those who report sexual offences. And that's why, in line with the commitment we made in our manifesto, we've prioritised the allocation of resources to fund uh, a review into the way forensic medical examinations are undertaken by health boards. We've also legislated through the Victims and Witnesses Act to ensure that those who report sexual offences should be able to choose the gender of their police interviewer. Additionally, we have awarded just under £2 million to Rape Crisis Scotland last year to enhance the support that's available for survivors of sexual violence. Uh, and Police Scotland's National Rape Task Force, which was established in 2013, ensures that specifically trained officers are involved in the investigation of rape and sexual offence cases. Claire Baker. I welcome the First Minister's answer. The First Minister will be aware of the recent study from Glasgow Caledonian University into the treatment of rape victims. Medical examinations are still predominantly carried out by male specialists. Examinations are often delayed due to lack of an available doctor. And Police Scotland officers describe the treatment of some victims as despicable and horrendous. I welcome the resources pledged by the government over the next few years, but victims are supporting, reporting these concerns now. When can we expect to see the much needed improvements delivered, including an increase in the number of female specialists? First Minister. Well, I intend that we see these improvements uh, delivered on an ongoing basis. I recognise the, the difficulties that Claire Baker has outlined. Um, some of the issues around the implementation of what is now in statute about allowing people to choose the gender of their interviewer. Some of the difficulties with implementation of that comes down to a lack of female uh, specialists. So that is something that is currently uh, being considered. Uh, there are also issues around forensic examinations, uh, which is why we've allocated funding uh, to deal specifically with that. Uh, the objective here is, is a clear one, and I, I know it's one that Claire Baker uh, will absolutely support. Uh, victims should be offered an examination uh, by, done by someone of the gender of their choice in an appropriate location and within an appropriate timescale. I accept that that does not always happen right now uh, for victims of rape and uh, the purpose of all of the work that is underway is to make sure that in future that does happen. Uh, people who uh, are victims of rape uh, have already uh, undergone horror and trauma that uh, nobody should ever have to undergo and what we must make sure is that the justice system, however inadvertently it might be, does not add to that trauma and that horror by the way in which investigations are carried out and I, I'm sure there's a determination not just across this chamber but across all of the relevant services to make sure that these improvements happen and that they happen quickly. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government plans are for local government reform. First Minister. Well, we will continue to work uh, positively and collaboratively with local government. Our aim is to transform our democratic landscape while protecting uh, and reforming our public services. Our Community Empowerment Act will strengthen the voices of communities and the decisions that affect them. Uh, and in the future, we will work with local authorities to review their roles and responsibilities and put more power into the hands of communities. Uh, we'll also consult in a bill that will require local authorities, uh, where appropriate, to decentralise functions, budgets and democratic oversight to local communities. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, uh, but the principle of enabling local control, not on behalf of a community, but by a community, should be the key principle that guides us in all of this. 
Mr Gibson. I thank the First Minister for a comprehensive answer. This year, the UK Tory government cut our resource budget by £371 million, with similar cuts to come in each of the next three years. Labour's only answer is to burden low-income Scots by hiking their income tax year on year. The SNP manifesto pledges to review the roles and responsibilities of local authorities and their relationships with health boards. When will this review begin, and will the protection and enhancement of frontline service delivery to minimise the impact of Westminster cuts be a key driver? First Minister. Well, we have committed to work with local authorities to review the roles and responsibilities and also the relationships with health boards. Uh, and uh, the purpose of all of this is to get more powers into the hands of communities. Uh, we'll outline uh, the details of how we will take this uh, forward in the forthcoming uh, legislative programme uh, at the start of the new session. Um, uh, we'll begin discussion shortly with key stakeholders on the scope and timing of this review, uh, and it will be underway uh, before the end of this year. Thank you, First Minister. That concludes First Minister's questions. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament.